Welcome to Auto Chatter. Today's episode is about the short-lived Geo brand from the 1990s. This import fighter that tried to compete by selling imports is an interesting tale and worth chatting about. As always, facts, opinions, and speculation will be given. Please like, subscribe, and share as it helps my channel a lot. Now let's see why Geo came to be and who was out to benefit from this domestic company selling imports arrangement. In the 1980s, General Motors had a problem. They were having difficulty making small entry-level cars at a profit and be well built. Their early attempts had mixed reviews at best. The Chevy Corvair in the 1960s was successfully eviscerated as a death trap by a political activist named Ralph Nader. Was this deserved is another story. The Chevy Vega that launched in the early 70s became a rust-prone, recall-laden, reliability nightmare. The mid-70s brought us the Chevy Monza and other GM badge versions of the same vehicle that were a little better, but import market shares kept growing, especially from Japan. By the early 1980s, the J-Body cars debuted, which was GM's first front-wheel drive subcompacts. These included cars like the Chevy Cavalier, Pontiac Sunbird, Buick Skyhawk, and others. They fared better still, but GM couldn't make profits on the subcompacts and the import onslaught kept coming. Japanese cars had about 25% of the US market by 1982. I can't blame the public but so much. By this point, people had very unfond memories of Ford Pintos possibly catching fire from a rear impact or watching the Chevy Vega in their driveway literally falling apart. Meanwhile, your neighbor's 8-year-old Datsun or Toyota was running like a top. So the solution for domestic automakers was simple. You push politicians to pass things like the Voluntary Export Restraint Agreement, which they did. It limited how many Japanese cars could be imported to the US. So now the Japanese vehicle's profit margin gets even better. Good job. Toyota had a problem too, though. Honda had a factory in Ohio for years making motorcycles and in 1982 they started building cars there. Those cars were not subject to the Voluntary Export Restraint Agreement. Toyota felt the need to get some cars out on their own and built here and fast. So in 1983, Toyota made a deal with General Motors to have a joint venture plant in California called the New United Motors Manufacturing, or NUMI for short. This GM factory was already there but recently closed. The factory started making cars again about eight months after the deal was struck in 1984. Half of what was built there was Toyota Corollas. The other half were also Toyota Corollas, sort of, but rebadged as Chevy Novas. So what's GM getting out of all of this? Knowledge. They wanted to know what Toyota's secrets were to build a high quality vehicle at a profit and also offering a car under their own brand name to get visions of Chevy Vegas out of people's minds. Toyota had already had longer term plans to have their own factory in the US, but uh, this also gave them the opportunity to navigate the differences in having an assembly plant in the US versus Japan, like dealing with union workers for example. What better tour guide for that than General Motors? I'm getting some serious gung-ho vibes at this point. Gung-ho is a great movie from 1986 starring Michael Keaton. Check it out. Anyway, the stage is set now for one of the vehicles that will eventually have a Geo badge. Now let's move on to Geo itself. By the late 1980s, GM already had plans in place to launch a brand new car division called Saturn as a direct import fighter. But for these rebadged imports, they decided to create another car division, or a semi one. I can explain. Geo was only sold at Chevrolet dealerships, so it's technically a subdivision. So for 1989, we get Geo. What did Geo have on the showroom floor?
Obviously, their version of the Corolla is there. The Nova is no more, and it's uh, now called a Geo Prism. It's technically a uh, rebadged Toyota Sprinter, which is a Toyota that we never got here under their own name. Think cheaper Corolla. Like the Corolla version might have a 4-speed automatic available, where the Geo Prism would be a 3-speed one. That kind of stuff. The Geo version was unique as you could get a 5-door hatchback version that uh, never sold here as a Toyota. That particular model didn't sell well though and the body style was eventually dropped leaving just the sedan. Geo also had sporty GSI and fancier LSI trims that put those models closer to everything you could get on a Corolla back then. In 1993 the Prism and the Corolla was redesigned. They got larger and uh, finally you could get a 4-speed automatic on the Prism as an option like the Toyota had before. Options like leather was also now available on the Geo Prism and I believe this was the only Geo model that ever even offered cowhide seats. 1989 Prisms had a starting MSRP of $9,995 or about $24,000 today. The Geo Metro probably the most famous or infamous Geo model. GM recently acquired a stake in Suzuki and we got a rebadged version of the Suzuki Swift or Cultus model here. Like the Toyota based Nova, you could buy the previous version of this car at your Chevy dealership too. It was called a Chevy Sprint and came out in the mid 80s. The redesigned Sprint is now called the Geo Metro. These were built at a joint GM Suzuki plant in Canada. This was an MPG monster, getting up to 58 miles per gallon in base trim, and all first-gen metros had a three-cylinder engine with 55 horsepower or so. They made convertible versions too that Suzuki didn't offer. Cheap convertibles in the late 1980s and going into the 90s was a lot more common than today. You could even get a convertible Yugo back then. The metro was a tiny yet slow car that didn't offer much besides great gas mileage and a cheap asking price. The Suzuki version also sold here had a sporty Swift GT model with a 16 valve 4 cylinder that had to be 10 times more fun to drive. For 1995 the Metro got a redesign and was a little larger. You could even get a 4 cylinder in the fancier trims now. The 4 door versions became sedans while the 3 door hatchbacks looked a little less like an egg this time. Canada had Pontiac versions of the Metro called a Firefly. 89 Metro's MSRP started at $6,551 or about $15,800 today. The Chevy Spectrum was an Isuzu built car that GM started selling here in the mid 1980s and for 1989 it was renamed the Geo Spectrum. The Isuzu version was an iMark. GM owned a stake in Isuzu since the early 70s and by this point Isuzu was involved in several small vehicles with GM over the years. This is the shortest lived Geo model as its replacement was coming soon anyway. They literally just slapped the Geo badge on the back of it for 1989. It was a small four cylinder car available in two or four doors and was bigger than a Metro, but a little smaller than the Prism. I discussed more about the iMark in my Isuzu video. They were uh, built in Japan. The Geo Spectrum MSRP in 1989 was $7,295 or $17,500 today. This small SUV was a rebadged Suzuki Sidekick and the Geo Tracker they were both built in a joint GM Suzuki plant in Canada where the metros were also made. These were the successors to the Suzuki Samurai even though Samurais were still sold here alongside Sidekicks for another half decade or so. In 1989 you got about 80 horsepower from a 1.6 liter 4 in your Tracker. These were available in four-wheel drive only until 1992 
and it is a real four-wheel drive system with high and low range four-wheel drive gearing. It's built on a truck chassis, so don't confuse it for an early crossover. The Suzuki X90 was a mechanical twin to the Tracker and the Sidekick. I discussed in my X90 chatter, it came out for the 1996 model year. They never made a Geo version of those. This Geo Mini Jeep Wrangler was fun off-road, but not the most comfy choice for traveling cross-country. Come to think of it, a Wrangler then wouldn't be that fun on a long highway drive either. The Tracker came in two-door convertible or two-door hardtop. MSRP in 1989 was about 10500 or 25200 today. This was another Isuzu built vehicle. Technically, the Isuzu Stylus replaced the iMark, which was what the Geo Spectrum was. They built uh, other cars off the same platform though, which was this. The redesigned Isuzu Impulse and the Geo Storm. GM already had the Geo Prism, so a rebadged Stylus in their lineup was probably seen as redundant. The Storm was the Geo version of the new Impulse and came out for the 1990 model year. The Isuzu version had an all-wheel drive turbocharged model available, and the styling was a little different from the Storm, enough so that it didn't look like a carbon copy of each other, unlike most of the rest of the lineup. Storms and Impulses were both built by Isuzu in Japan. The Storm was front-wheel drive only, and had either a 95 horsepower or hotter 130 horsepower in sportier trims. Easily the quickest and sporty geos that were made. They originally had semi pop up headlights, but went to a fixed Pontiac looking design in 1992. Two body styles were available with a coupe and a much more rare hatchback. Storms were actually very popular geo models, but their life was cut short. Isuzu did some major company restructuring and stopped producing cars after the 1993 model year. They only made trucks and SUVs after 93, so the Storm had to go. A 1990 Geo Storm had an MSRP of $11,650 or $26,500 or so in 2022. GM dissolved the Geo sub-brand after the 1997 model year. The Metro, Prism, and Tracker were badged as Chevrolets for 1998. By 2004, the Tracker was the last Geo name vehicle remaining, and it was gone too. Geo isn't remembered by many nowadays, and some of you watching may not have even been alive until after Geo's demise. For rural markets, it was probably nice then if you wanted an import, you had the option to purchase one at your local Chevy dealership. If your town was small enough, there might not have been any foreign car dealerships otherwise. In my small town, you had domestics, Toyota, and Nissan then. Everything else would have been at least a 45 minute drive away. To urban dwellers though, there wasn't as much incentive to seek GOs out over the originals, as they were not all that much cheaper to buy, and the warranty might have actually been better on the Japanese badge version. Anyway. This has been my Geo Chatter. I do hope you liked it. Please give a like or subscribe to let me know. If you owned a Geo, share a tale or two in the comments about it. And thank you. Until next time, Chatter out.